Dreams of Trespass, Chapter 2 Shahrazad, the King and the Words One late afternoon, Mother took the time to explain to me why the tales were called A Thousand and One Night. It was no accident, because for each one of those many, many nights, Shahrazad, the young bride, had to spin an entrance in captivating tale to make her husband, the king, forget his angry plan to execute her at dawn. I was terrorized. Mother, do you mean that if the king did, does not like Shahrazad's story, he will call in his CF, executioner? I kept asking for alternatives for the poor, poor girl. I wanted other possibilities. How could the story displease the king, yet Shahrazad be allowed to live? Why could Shahrazad not just say what she wanted, without having to worry about the king? Or why could she not reverse the situation in, in the palace, and request that the king tell her a captivating story every night? Then he would realize how frightening it was to have to please someone who had the power to chop off your head. Mother said that I needed to hear the details first, then I could look for escapes. Shahrazad's marriage to the king, she said, was not a normal one at all. It had taken place under very bad circumstances. King Shahrayar had discovered his wife in bed with a slave, and deeply hurt and enraged, he, be he beheaded them both. To his great amazement, however, he discovered that the double murder was not enough to make him forget his ferocious anger. Revenge became his, high, his nightly obsession. He needed to kill more women, so he asked his vizier, the highest official in his court, who, who also happened to be Shahrazad's father, to bring him a virgin every night. The king would then marry her, stay with her for that night, and then order her executed at dawn. And so he did for three years, killing more than 1,000 innocent girls, till folks raised outcry against him and cursed him, praying Allah utterly to destroy him and his rule. And women made an uproar, and mothers wept, and parents fled with their daughters, till there remained not, not in the city a young person for carnal copulation. Carnal copulation, explained mother, was cousin Samir, when cousin Samir jumped up and down and yelled for an explanation, was when bride and groom lay together in a bed and slept until morning. Finally, one day in all the city, there was only two versions left, Shahrazad, the eldest daughter of the vizier, and her little sister, Danyazad. When the vizier went home and ex at the evening, pale and preoccupied, Shahrazad asked him what was the matter. He told her his problem, and she reacted in a way her father did not expect at all. Instead of begging him to help her escape, she immediately volunteered to go and spend the night with the king. I wish thou wouldst give me in marriage to the king Shahrayar, she said. Either I shall live or I shall be a ransom for the virgin daughters of Muslims and the cause of their deliverance from his hand and thine. Shahrazad's father, who loved her dearly, opposed such a plan, and tried to convince her that she had to help him think of another solution. Marrying her off to Shahrayar was like condemning her to a certain death. But she, unlike her father, was convinced that, that she had exceptional power and could stop the killing. She would cure the troubled king's soul simply by talking to him about things that had happened to others. She would take him to faraway lands to observe foreign ways, so he, would, so he could get closer to the strangeness within himself. She would help him see the, his prison, his obsessive hatred for women. Shahrazad was sure that if she could bring the king to see himself, he would want to change and love more. Reluctantly, her father gave in, and she was married that very night to Shahraya. As soon as she entered the king Shahrayar's bedroom, Shahrazad started telling him such marvelous story, which she cleverly left hanging at the most suspenseful part, that he could not bear to part with her at dawn. So he, so he let her live until the next night, so she could finish her tale. But on the second night, Shahrazad told him another wonderful story, which she was again far from finishing when dawn arrived, and the king had to let her live again. The same thing happened the next night and the next for a thousand nights, which is almost three years, until the king was unable to imagine living without her. 
By then, they already had two children, and after a thousand and one nights, he renounced his terrible habit of chopping off women's heads. When mother finished Shahrazad's story, I cried. But how does one learn to how to tell stories which please kings? Mother mumbled as if talking to herself, that that was women's lifetime work. This reply did not help me much, of course, but then she added that all I needed to know for the moment was that my chances of happiness would depend upon how skillful I become with words. With this knowledge, Samir and I, who had already decided to avoid upsetting the grown-ups with unwelcomed words, thanks to the radio incident, started training ourselves. We would sit for hours silently practicing, chewing words, and turning them seven times around our tongues, all, the wa- all while watching the grown-ups to see if they were noticing anything. But the grown-ups never noticed anything, especially on the courtyard level, where life was very proper and strict. Only upstairs were things less rigid. Their divorced and widowed aunts, relatives and their children occupied a maze of small rooms. The number of relatives living with us at any one time varied according to the amount of conflicts in their lives. Distant female relatives would sometimes come to seek refuge on our top floors for a week when they got into fights with their husbands. Some would come to stay with their children for a short time only, just to show their husbands that they had another place to stay, that they could survive on their own and were not desperately dependent. This strategy often was successful, and they would return home in a stronger bargaining position. But other relatives came to stay for good, after divorce or some other serious problem. And this was one of the traditions father always worried about whenever someone attacked the institution of harem life. Where will the troubled women go? He would say. The rooms upstairs were very simple, with white tiled floors, whitewashed walls, and spare furniture. Very narrow sofas, upholstered with multi flowers, peasants, cottons, and cushions, were scattered here and there along with easily washable raffia mats. Wet feet, slippers, and even occasional slipped cup of tea did not produce the same excessive uh, reactions up here as they did downstairs. Life upstairs was so much easier, especially since everything was also accompanied by Hanan, a Moroccan emotional quality that I rarely have uh, encountered elsewhere. Hanan is hard to define exactly. But basically, it is free-flowing, easy-going, unconditionally available tenderness. People who give Hanan, like Aunt Habiba, never threaten to withdraw their love when you commit some unintentional minor or even major infraction. Hanan was hard to come by downstairs, especially among the mothers who were too busy teaching you to respect the frontiers to bother with tenderness. Upstairs was also the place to go for storytelling. You would climb the the hundreds of glazed steps that led all the way all the way up to the third and top floor of the house and the terrace which lay before it, all whitewashed, spacious, and inviting. That was where Aunt Habiba had her room, small and quite empty. Her husband had kept everything from her from their marriage, with the idea that should he ever lift his fingers and ask her to come home again, she would bow her head and come rushing back. But he can never take the most important thing away from me, Aunt Habiba would say sometimes. My laughter and all the wonderful stories I can tell when the audience is worth it. I once asked Cousin Malika what our aunt meant by an audience who is worth it, and she confessed that she did not know either. I said maybe we should ask her directly, but Malika said no. Better not, because Aunt Habiba might start crying. Aunt Habiba often cried for no reason. Everyone said so, but we loved her, and could hardly sleep on Thursday night, so excited were were we at prospects of her Friday storytelling session. These gatherings usually ended in great confusion, because they lasted too long. According to our mothers, who were often forced to climb up all those stairs to fetch us, and then we would scream, and the most spoiled of my cousins, like Samir, would roll on the floor and shout that they did not feel sleepy, not not at all.
What if you did manage to stay until the story ended? That is, until the heroine triumphed over her enemies and crossed back over the seven rivers, seven mountains, and seven seas. You were faced with yet another problem. You were scared to go back downstairs. First of all, there was no light. The switches to the stairs lights were all controlled by Ahmed, the doorkeeper, from the entrance gate. He turned them off at 9 p.m. to signal that everyone on the terrace was going in and all traffic ought to be officially stopped. The second problem was that a whole population of genies, demons, was out there, lurking in silence and waiting to jump out on you. And last but not least was the fact that Cousin Samir would, was so good at imitating the genies that I often mistook him for the real thing. Several times I literally had to f- feign passing out to get him to stop from posing as a genie. Sometimes when the story lasted for hours, the mothers did not appear, and the whole house fell suddenly silent. We would beg Aunt Habiba to let us spend the night with her. She would unfold her beautiful bridal carpet, the one she kept carefully folded behind her cedar sheet chest, and cover it with a clean white sheet and perfume it with orange flower water, special for the occasion. She did not have enough cushions for all of us to use as pillows, but that was not a problem, as we did not care. She would share with us her huge heavy wool blanket, turn off the electric light and place a, a big candle on the threshold of our, at our feet. If by any chance someone needs to go urgently to the toilet, she would say, remember that this carpet is, not, is one of uh, the only things I have which reminds me of my previous life as a happily married lady. So on these graceful nights, we would fall asleep listening to our aunt's voice, opening up magic glass doors leading to the moonlight meadows. And when we awoke in the morning, the whole city lay at our feet. Aunt Habiba had a small room, but a large window with a view that reached as far as the northern mountains. She knew how to talk in the night. With words alone, she could put us onto a large ship sailing from Aden to Maldives, or take us to an island where the birds spoke like human beings. Riding on her words, we traveled past Sindh and Hind, India, leaving Muslim territories behind, living dangerously and making friends with Christians and Jews, who shared their bizarre food with us and watched us do our prayers while we watched them on the do theirs. Sometimes we had traveled so far that no gods were to be found, only sun and fire worshippers, but even they seemed friendly and endearing when introduced by Aunt Habiba. Her tales made me long to become an adult and an expert storyteller myself. I wanted to learn how to talk in the night.